In the Canadian welding industry, the people are represented by two separate but equally important groups. The instructors who diagnose bad welds and the welders who learn from their mistakes. These are their stories. Dun dun! I just got finished up with the spagos and yeah. stuff. Dr. Uh, J, I'm glad you could make it. Yeah, no worries. Uh, so what are we working, what are we dealing with here? Well, come this way. Dr. J, uh, the night custodian is really shaken up. He was cleaning up back there and he's it's he stumbled upon a real mess. It's a real mess. We could really use your help back there. Okay. Uh, Figure out what happened. Are you okay if I send a video report in for this? That'd be fantastic. Okay, whereabouts is it? Just back here. Okay, thanks. Oh, dear God. I haven't seen something this bad since the summer of 88. Well, one at a time. I guess let's figure out what's happened here. All right, let's start with a really easy one here. So right off the bat, this one is a very beginner rookie mistake. There is no welding done here, just a bunch of off-cut welding wire here, and uh, absolutely zero signs of arcing or starting of the welding process. So what's happened here? This is kind of a rookie beginner mistake. The ground clamp has not been hooked up, so when the person went to go to weld, they could get the wire to feed out, but absolutely no welding happens, and they got frustrated and just basically gave up here. So this is a missing ground clamp. Put it on and you'll be back in business. Sometimes these weld samples are really hard to figure out what happened to them, and sometimes it's blatantly obvious what the demise of this weld sample was. In this case, it was definitely due to lack of a shielding gas. You've got some telltale signs of black and brown soot and carbon around the weld bead. That's one good indicator. Another one is we've got holes in our weld here, and near the end it's really super obvious. It's just Swiss cheese in here from the atmospheric gases and air getting into our metal molten puddle and frothing it up before it cools down and solidifies. Now, if we wanted some extra evidence to collaborate with this, we just refer to the bottle and see if they actually opened up the gases or not. Now to confirm our theory about what happened to this welding sample, if you take a look at these gauges, those needles are both at zero. Nobody 
bleeds these regulators out when they're done using them. All they do is they close the main cylinder valve here and that leaves the pressure in the gauges. So someone has assumed that the bottle's on, not opened it, and then when they started welding, the gases have purged out of the lines and they have dropped to zero and that is why there's soot and porosity in this weld. Now with this weld sample it's a little bit trickier because at first glance there doesn't look like there's much wrong with this weld sample. We don't see excessive carbon, there's no excessive spatter, there's no porosity, the weld bead looks nice and straight, the travel speed has been very steady, uh, everything looks really great on this. However, it does have a telltale sign that this setting is too cold and too low a wire speed. Now the telltale sign is it literally is sitting up kind of like a worm or a piece of bird poop on top of this metal surface and that's because it simply isn't hot enough to melt or penetrate into the base material giving it good strength. Now this is a con for MIG welders and the untrained hands these things can make beautiful looking welds that actually don't hold anything. There's no penetration because it's not set properly. So uh, if you take a look at it from this side you can see it a little bit more. It just sits up a little bit lumpy up off the surface rather than melting in and having good penetration. Alright, this weld sample has suffered from settings on the machine that are just way too hot. Uh, it's got all the telltale signs, the weld bead has flattened out and it's gotten a lot wider. And sometimes if it's really hot, too hot, you can have some undercutting in the base material as the weld puddle kind of robs the material right out of the base metal. And there is some excess carbon on here just due to the extra oxidization going on from the extra heat. Now, technically, a hotter weld can actually be stronger because we have some really good penetration going into the metal. However, sometimes it has some drastic uh, other effects that we don't want, such as the base material um, starting to warp under the excessive heat. So that's one thing. And then you may actually not want your weld bead to penetrate so well that it goes right through the material and starts coming through and popping holes, especially you see this on sheet metal and if we were to compare this to the cold sample you can see the difference cold not enough heat to even melt the the puddle to the base material and this one here we've got so much heat that it's flattening out and penetrating through into the base material but maybe too much I've seen some horrible welding in my life, but you never quite get used to seeing a gruesome scene like this. This is showing signs of too much stick out or the torch is just too far away from the base material. So we end up with lots of balls of spatter all over the area here. Think of it as when you throw a rock in a puddle of water, the splash that happens. Well, when you throw electricity down into a molten puddle, it splashes and that's what's sending those little balls of spatter around. Now, because the stick out is too far, the heat from the electricity is also going into the wire itself and just melting off and depositing chunks of wire on top of the surface. Uh, we've got not a good shield cloud because we're too far away. So we've got some excess carbon. There's going to be some porosity in here. 
And then if you look at what kind of puddle that has still been able to be able to be welded here, it is a very cold looking weld, meaning it's sitting up and lumpy on the top of the surface. And that's because the gun is too far away to get the heat from the arc to get to go into the base material and melt it properly into it. So this is showing signs of too much stick out. And uh, keep in mind, this was only roughly probably about an inch away from the material. And uh, we should be getting about three eighths to no more than half of an inch when you're doing this MIG welding. Now this weld sample is showing signs that this was a rush job. The butcher of a welder wanted to get in, do the job, and get out before anybody saw them do this. And uh, the telltale signs is once again, it's got kind of that too cold look. It's kind of sitting lumpy up on top of the base material. So because they're going so fast, they don't have enough time to get some heat in there and get good penetration. And then it's a little hard to see, so I'll show you a different angle here. When you look at the actual pattern of the weld puddle hardening up as the person is moving, if it's a smooth, uh, even rate, you're going to end up with C's like this. But when they go too fast, they tend to kind of get pulled. Imagine kind of like the top surface of gravy as it's getting thick and you drag a knife or something in the top skin of the gravy as it's hardening. And you'll end up kind of dragging these kind of like V shapes in it. And that's a sign that you're going too fast. You are still pulling the wire as the pedal's starting to kind of harden up and you're getting that V pattern rather than a nice C pattern in your weld bead. I'll get a little zoom in here so you can see that for sure. And there's that classic V shape that I was talking about. So no longer do we have a nice C pattern as a circular puddle kind of hardens behind our travel rate. We actually are kind of dragging it and making that V shape in it. So you start seeing V's like that and the weld looks too cold. Slow down. You are going too fast. Could the butcher still be here? Ha! <laughs> What's wrong? I just had a nightmare that I was a horrible welder. Oh no, I'm sorry, babe. Oh.